I think people should probably change their mind about things more than they do. You know, especially in the U.S., we have two major parties that take pretty unrelated sets of issues, and the more of a quote-unquote partisan you become, the more likely you are to have an opinion on gay marriage that correlates with your opinion on tax policy and whatnot. Facts are stubborn things, and also things that are hard to uncover in kind of a very complicated, noisy universe sometimes. You know, I think one reason why, you know, 538-type mentality people don't get along with political people so well is because political people are, are extremely stubborn in their viewpoints and think it's all about, I know how the world works, I just have to advocate and persuade people. I'm on the side that says, you know, actually, collectively, there's a lot we don't know, a lot we still have to figure out, um, and we probably overrate how complex and complicated the world can be. My name is Nate Silver. I'm the editor-in-chief of 538.com. Um, ask me anything. So yeah, let's talk a little bit of Donald Trump. For some reason, a premise that I think is a little bit ridiculous has developed, which is that because his polls didn't change from mid-July to early August when there was no real news that somehow this demonstrates much of anything. I think if you look at what political scientists are saying about Donald Trump, what we've been saying at 538 about Donald Trump, the prediction is that Trump is probably not gonna win the nomination. And by probably I mean the chances are, you know, 2% or somewhere on that order. Not zero, but not a whole lot above zero. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, there are a lot of stages at which he could uh, kind of implode. Most voters aren't like uh, political junkies. They're not like journalists. They're not paying that much attention to the campaign. It could be that when you actually start to talk to real likely voters in Iowa and New Hampshire, his numbers decline. It could be that he still keeps 20% of the vote in Iowa and New Hampshire. It could be he competes for longer than that, but the GOP really, really doesn't want to nominate him and so consolidates behind another candidate. You know, I'm not sure which of those four or five scenarios it will be, um, and it might happen slowly, it might happen quickly, um, but all the historical evidence would suggest that Donald Trump is not a Ronald Reagan, doesn't have the background, not nearly as popular with Republicans. 25% of people might like him. A lot of the 75% don't very much. Um, but, you know, my answer is basically Donald Trump is no Ronald Reagan. Yeah, I think um, Bernie Sanders, it's not that complicated a case to, to diagnose. Um, the fact that he's not accepting PAC money is a challenge, but it's mostly about the fact that um, that he is further left than not just most Americans, but most Democrats. You know, I think he's starting discussions you don't hear about a lot otherwise. But the fact is, is that if you ask Democrats, um, you know, who are you closer to on the issues, they say most of them, two thirds of them, say I'm closer to Hillary Clinton and not to Bernie Sanders. Um, on top of that, you do have some other issues about the Democratic Party would be concerned about his electability, potentially. He is, I think I'm going from memory here, I think he's 74 years old or, or 73. He has not done a good job so far um, of capturing the black and Hispanic vote, which is a very important constituency, of course, for the Democratic Party. Um, so there are some issues like that too, but, but if you had to summarize it with just one one concept, just that, yeah, he's he's kind of further left than than the median voter is in the Democratic Party. There are a couple of factors I think about. One of which, as a journalist, is kind of how much time you'd have to invest in a problem. There are certain types of areas, sports, elections, for instance, um, some economic data where you can get pretty far uh, down the way uh, pretty quickly, and that's really important to us as journalists, whereas, you know, trying to analyze, for example, foreign policy, like a war through fiscal lens, you could do it 
but it'd probably be more something you would want to write a book about or um, have a PhD thesis about than something you turn around on a daily or weekly news cycle. Look, the challenging areas are areas where, where you don't have a lot of historical data to work from or where the conditions change so fast that the old examples aren't very useful. The problem though is that a lot of the things that are hard to uh, hard to study through statistics are also pretty hard to study through other means as well. The most obvious answer is that now we have a staff, so I spend probably half my time roughly managing and editing. When it comes to politics stuff, um, I get a little bit more jaded <laughs> and cynical, right? It's kind of not my first rodeo as much. Um, and so kind of you see people who act like everything that's happening in this campaign is happening for the first time. You know, there are parallels to the Trump surge, for example, with, with Gingrich in 2011 or Pat Buchanan in 91 and 92. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, a lot more focused on promoting the whole project we're undertaking at 538 instead of my, my personal brand. Um, so I guess I'd start with uh, the most generic advice ever, which I think is still true, um, but learn how to code or keep working on how to code, whereas the market is like tough for journalists in general. Um, that's an exception. If you know how to code and you have good uh, journalistic acumen too, then you're very much in demand right now. Um, the other thing I realized after having spent a year and change now at the new 538 running a newsroom is that Getting a sense for what the metabolism of a journalistic newsroom is, is, is pretty important, right? So whether it's at 538 or somewhere else, if you really do want to go into journalism, you know, make your summer internships in the journalistic field. It probably won't pay as well, but just um, you just kind of face different issues than you would in the academic sector. We also have a couple of positions open at 538 too. So we are hiring for a, uh, a visual journalist. I'm not sure if it's been posted officially yet, but that will be going up really soon. That's a full-time job. Um, you know, we will have summer internships, possibly also a round of fall and spring internships, so look for those. And also, um, for the first time, we've started to accept uh, some freelance visualization work. If you can produce graphics that tell a story, particularly in kind of our style, or you're able to work with our journalists on staff, then that's a way to get on the site too, potentially. Yeah, so I am in 100% Agreement. I'm not sure why calculus is privileged over um, statistics and probability and even kind of more general mathematical logic and reasoning. Um, you know, the fact is that if you go into a field um, in which calculus is important, you'll probably wind up relearning it um, almost from scratch in, in college anyway, um, and then probably in your graduate school program. Um, I don't know, I'm a little biased obviously, you know, I think our society is not terribly literate about probability and statistics and that goes not just for regular folks but also for, you know, the media for instance. Um, but yeah, to me that should be the first priority and then for, um, for advanced students who are pursuing a pure math background or likely to go into a science major in college or just like the subject, it is fascinating in its own way then calculus is available. But it seems like the, the priority is exactly flipped from, from what it should be. Not saying calculus is a bad thing, um, but it's not as urgent as, as statistics. Um, so uh, I am not quite the right person to answer this question, but we rely on a combination of um, tools we've built internally and public domain stuff, but we have a product called um, chart builder that actually is not just ours but a lot of news organizations share that becomes the basis for some things um, you know some things that look fancy like some of our um, our charts are actually in Excel Microsoft Excel templates that people have de developed not for 
not for charts, excuse me, not for graphics, but for like just tables, right? Other stuff that was really custom made, as I'm sure people on this channel know, it can take as long to make a good chart or longer as to write the article sometimes, and often it's the most important part of what we do. Um, we cover a lot of topics, so if you're not, if you don't have some continuity in the sense of, oh, this feels like 538 to me, then it risks falling apart a little bit more. Um, and also, you know, information design is essential to conveying information accurately, as banal as it sounds, you know, that's a big purpose here too, of course. So I appreciate that you, um, you are fans of our, of our style, and that's, that's deliberate. That was a choice that, um, that Andre Schenkman and the rest of the graphics team, um, interactive team, made early on, and I think it was a really smart choice. All right, guys, thank you for your questions. I need to get back to actually interview a job candidate for uh, not a visual journalist position. Um, but we hope you keep checking out 538. We have a lot of cool stuff planned for, um, for the fall. We finally kind of gotten our, our uh, what's the metaphor here? Um, but we've kind of gotten on front of ground where we're planning longer and more ambitious projects that mix visual storytelling with our journalism, with analysis. Um, you know, thanks again for the questions and we'll do it again sometime soon.